Well, good morning and welcome to St. Thomas of Becket today. I'm very glad you're able to join us here on our online service. It's a wonderful day today. For today, we celebrate and continue to celebrate the season of Easter. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. We continue to celebrate this wonderful season of Easter together. And although we are distant, or although we are far away from one another, we can continue to celebrate. We can continue to worship together as the family and as the people of God. So I'm very thankful that you're able to join us today. And I encourage you to, to, uh, to comment, to like, to subscribe, to share this video around. I encourage you to continue to uh, express your worship through sharing the message and the word of God with those around you. Talk about him. Sing about him. Praise him for what he has done in your life. For our God is worthy and he is good. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship. Together, let us say the words of the Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. We continue on now with our readings for the day. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it, it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. 
Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And, though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your words be spoken and your words be heard. Lord, move our hearts and our minds. Lord, to hear your word opened to us this day. Lord, help us to hear as you want us to hear. We pray these things all in your blessed name, Jesus. Amen. We continue along with our sermon series today, following the story, and we come to a new chapter, chapter 28, called New Beginnings. It's called New Beginnings because last week the people encountered Easter. They encountered their risen Lord. What do you call life after that experience? How do you go about life after that moment? After that new truth? Well, you start over. You start a new chapter. You start a new book of your life. And that's what the people do. The disciples, they didn't follow Jesus any longer as they, as they did day in, day out. They couldn't, for he came and went. And then one day he gathered them all together. And he spoke to them and he said, Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the gift I'm going to give you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples did just this. They waited in Jerusalem. And then the Spirit of God came upon them when they were in the upstairs room. And there, their lives again were changed. Power, strength, encouragement, boldness was filling them. They were excited. They praised God for who he was loudly, shouted. They were so joyful and thankful for God touching their life. Their lives were changed. What does that look like? What does that mean? Well, I once went on a mission trip with a friend, and we went to Sierra Leone, or a group of us. And when we came back, this person had such a profound, powerful experience there of seeing God work in the people, seeing God work in their own life, seeing the different way that this people lived from the way she lived. And so as we gathered back together in our, in our home city, she looked at me and said, David, how do I go back to living after that? She said that she had a friend's birthday coming soon, but she didn't know what to buy or how to do something so 
simple or mundane as buying a birthday present. She had been so profoundly touched and changed from the experience. She didn't know how to live normally after that, because normal had been redefined. That was the case with the disciples. Their life after Jesus touched them with the Holy Spirit, after they had witnessed Easter, had just been utterly transformed. The disciples at this moment, they are praising God and shouting and exclaiming the wondrous things that he has done. People witnessing them started to think that they must be drunk. And then Peter gets up and he speaks and says, People, I'm not drunk. Rather, my life has been transformed and changed and touched by the power of God and his Holy Spirit. The people were astounded. They saw this energy, this excitement, this joy, and their lives were touched too. Peter told them and talked to them about how this came from Jesus Christ, the one that they crucified. The one that they chanted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That man. The people were, were grieved. The people were touched. The people saw the sin that, that they were a part of. The brokenness that they brought into the world. How the world had rejected its Lord and its Savior, its author. How they contributed to that. And their lives, too, were transformed. They came before God and they received his grace. They received his loving touch. And their, li their lives were changed. Now, this doesn't happen just to them. But it happens to all of us who encounter Jesus. Our lives are changed and yet Jesus, when he was alive and when he was, he was walking and teaching with his disciples, he gives this parable. And he gives this parable about two, two, two people who owe their master a certain amount of money. And the master forgives both debts. And one of the servants owes a little money and one owes a lot of money. And so Jesus asks this question, which servant will love the master more? And of course, the answer is, well, the one who had the bigger debt. And Jesus says, you're right. Well, Jesus is asking this question and giving this teaching in response to a person who has come in, poured oil on his feet, and kissed his feet. This radical, bizarre behavior. Jesus is praising it. Jesus is recognizing the heart of where this comes from. And it comes from a radically changed heart, a radically changed experience, a radical understanding of the brokenness that a person has and their need for God. What I'm suggesting is this. All of us have a response to God. And all of our responses to God are in relationship to our understanding of our need for him, of our need for grace, of what he has done in our life. We are touched and transformed, just as the disciples were, by the power of the Holy Spirit. How does that change us? How does that touch us? How does the truth of Easter transform our life? Well, how do you see yourself? How do you see your own brokenness? How do you see yourself contributing to the cross, to Jesus hanging there and his death? How you see that will change your experience, will change your encounter with the risen Jesus, will change what comes next. I say what comes next because it's an important question. For the disciples, after this point, aren't called disciples any longer. They have a moment where after their experience, they don't really know what to do. And so, well, they go back to their old stomping ground. They go back to doing what they know how to do. And the book of John records them as, as going out to fish, as we heard in our gospel story today. 
and there they are out in the fishing boat and they've caught nothing all day. Oh. And then they hear a voice from the shore and says, how you doing? You caught anything? And the last thing you want to hear, of course, when you've been trying to work and you just haven't gotten anywhere is, how you doing? I'm not doing very well, thanks for asking. Well, this voice back on the shore says, well, throw the net over the other side of the boat. Well, if you're a fisherman, you know that makes no difference. But of course, they do. And what do they do? They haul in a huge load of fish. Well, one of the disciples in this moment realizes we've had this experience before. It was when Jesus first called us. So one of the disciples looks at Peter and says, it's the Lord. And so Peter jumps over the side of the boat and gets to shore. And there he encounters Jesus. Jesus, in this moment, loves him, recommissions Peter, gives him a mission, a role, a job. And what does he do then? Does he continue to teach Peter? Does he continue to walk with him? Is Peter continue to be his disciple? Yes and no. For Peter is made more, just like all the disciples are. Because from this point on, the disciples aren't called the disciples anymore. The scriptures now record them as being called apostles. You might say, well, what is, what's the difference? What, matter, what does it matter? Well, the difference is the word apostle means one who is sent out. Disciple means a student. So, before when they walked with Jesus, they were being taught. They were learning. They were following what he looked like, who he was. But now being breathed on, being transformed by the truth of Easter and the power of the Holy Spirit, their lives are changed. They are now sent out into the world. They're now sent out to teach, to make disciples, to teach others to follow in the ways of Jesus, just as they learned. Now, you can say, David, what does that have to do with us? It has everything to do with us. In this time of COVID-19, in this time of difficulty and struggle, we're not able to meet together as a church, a meeting place. We're not able to congregate together. Well, there's been similar times to this in the church's history. And the church was weaker for it. It didn't collapse because of it. But it took a new turn and it took a new life. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit that God then drove people to no longer just congregate into one city, into one place, into one country, but spread them out across the entire world, sent them out. You are not able to gather at St. Thomas of Becket. We're not able to be congregants, congregating together. But you now have the opportunity to be out, to go out. There's an old saying that all roads lead to Rome. Well, the amazing thing about that story or that, that, that idiom is that therefore there are a lot of roads. And those roads go a lot of different places and can take you into many different places. In our world today, we have roads, of course, still. But we also have other highways, the internet superhighway. And you're able to watch this video and experience today because of that highway. But just as this information comes to you that way, you are able to take the gospel out on that same highway to be an apostle, to be one who is sent out with this witness, with this truth, and to be able to share that. Right now, we might be in a time where we're not able to congregate together. But remember that God's church continued to thrive. It exploded, actually, after that point. After the point where Jesus changed them from disciples to apostles. My encouragement to you today is this. 
For many years, you per perhaps have thought of yourself as a congregant. You may have thought of yourself as a disciple. Well, I encourage you today, I challenge you to think of yourself not only in these terms, but also as an apostle, one who is sent out. You might not know how to bring this truth to the world or who in the world to bring it to. Well, we'll continue to talk about those things. But to realize that you're not just a congregant, you're not just a disciple. But you have a uniqueness, an imprint of God upon you, the breath of God in you. And he's put these things in you, not just because but for a purpose. Your uniqueness is able, just like a key, to unlock something, to open something that couldn't be otherwise. Your uniqueness is able to touch the world and transform someone's life in a way that others couldn't. You're able to bring the truth of the gospel into lives you're able to bring the truth, the fullness of God's love, of his grace, of his forgiveness into lives that otherwise wouldn't be touched. You are an apostle. You have this mission. You are a missionary. God has called you. and He's done so for a reason. Now my challenge to you is this. You might not know what's next. I'm not suggesting you do. I'm suggesting you to begin to think of yourself in those terms. And as we continue to encounter the scriptures together, as we continue to talk about this New Testament world, I encourage you to start to, 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 to dream, to ask God to birth in you visions, to ask God to encourage you and to challenge you, to speak truth to you, that you might know his call, his mission in your life of how your uniqueness is meant to change the world and the lives of those around you. God bless you. May God's breath, may his life grow you to more than you can possibly ask or imagine. Let us confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed, as we say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our responsory for the prayers of the people today is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus, the good shepherd, has come, that we may have life in rich abundance. The Lord is our shepherd, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Let us bring to him our cares and concerns for the church and for the world. In our cycle of prayer, we remember the nations of India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. In the Anglican Communion around the world, we pray for Nippon Seiko Kai, the Anglican Communion in Japan. In Canada, we pray for our primate Linda Nichols. 
In the Diocese of Toronto, we pray for Andrew, our diocesan bishop, Jenny, our bishop, Anne, our metropolitan, and for new curates of the Diocese of Toronto. For our parish of St. Thomas of Becket, we pray for Reverend David Matthews and Carolyn Matthews, and for Reverend Michelle Stanford. In our parish family, we pray for Shantha and Nirmali. We pray for Elizabeth Taylor, for Sheila Day, and Trevea Isaacs, and Shakira and Asher. Good Shepherd of the Sheep, we pray for the Church, for all congregations, for pastors and all who minister in word and sacrament. We pray particularly for bishops in their shepherding of the world church. We pray for clear guidance and direction in those issues which disturb us, asking not that you lead us the easy way, but the way that is right and good. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Good shepherd of the sheep, we pray for the world we inhabit the world we have inherited and will pass on to successive generations. Teach us to look after it carefully and wisely, to share its gifts more fairly and work together to ease its sufferings. Turn the hearts of those who are excited by evil things and encourage the timid to speak out for what is wholesome and good. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Good shepherd of the sheep, we pray for our places of work, our colleagues, friends, and neighbors, and for the members of our families. We ask not for popularity at all costs, but the grace to do your will and be your witnesses to what it means to live lovingly, both when it is easy and also when it hurts. Gracious God, we pray for the testimony of St. Thomas Becket, Lord, that our love would be boundless Lord, that it would find its life and its source in you, that you would flow through us. Gracious God, we pray you would grow our testimony and grow our church. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Good shepherd of the sheep, we pray for the weak and the vulnerable, for those who must live depending on others for their every need, and for those who are bullied or constantly despised. We pray for greater reverence, one for another, for a greater willingness to uphold and encourage one another. We pray for healing and wholeness. And we pray for all who have special needs, remembering those who are in our congregation and those who are ill, especially at this time for Venita Brown. We also remember our family and our friends. I invite you now to take a moment and say aloud in the quiets of your hearts those for whom your prayers are needed. We pray that God's gracious and healing presence may be with them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Good shepherd of the sheep, we pray for those who have died. We pray for those who ache with sorrow at their going. And Lord, at this of time, we uphold the Baxter family, the Bozeman family, and the Hicks family. We commend those we've lost and those who are still here, all into your unfailing care, which lasts throughout this life and on into eternity. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Good shepherd of the sheep, we give you thanks that in you we are able to live through good and ill with abundance of life. Living God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make us perfect in every good work to do your will, and work in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, gathering our prayers and praises into one, we are bold to pray as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.